All right. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, so we want to welcome everyone to uh, Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season four, and today we have episode nine, and we will be going local today, right here in Berrien County. And so if you want to learn some more about Environmental Fridays, we have a website at www theenvironmentalfridays.com. Uh, so this month we had scheduled anyway, five uh, lectures and today's is one of them. Uh, previously, we heard from Suzanne in Trinidad um, talking about what's happening in Matura Beach and turtles and stuff. Last week, um, our speaker was ill, so we are going to reschedule him probably for the end of this uh, season four. Today, you will hear some more um, about our speaker, Nancy Carpenter from Berrien uh, Conservation District. Um, the following week, next week, Friday, we'll go back to the islands, Tobago, environmental conservation in the island of Tobago. And um, the last presentation for this month is from Vanessa Fraser. I believe she's out in Missouri and she'll talk about environmental health in rural communities. So that's what's going on for Environmental Fridays this month. Okay, at this time, I would like to introduce um, my co-host for today. Her name is Brand Brandy Wise Tenter, and she's an operations technology manager at Whirlpool Corporation, um, right here also in our county, Berrien County. She also is a chair of the Berrien Conservation Board of Directors, and hopefully, Nan, um, Brandy, you could also tell us a little bit about your time um, with the board, because I know you've served in different uh, capacities. She's a member of the State Council for Michigan Association of Conservation Districts. She has a MBA from Baker College. Where is Baker College? Is that Indiana? They have several locations. They have one in Flint. They have one in Muskegon. I went to Muskegon for my undergrad and Flint for my master's. Yes. So she has a master's. Brandy has a master's in human resource management and uh, undergrad degree in business administration and marketing. And she would tell you in her own words, in her own voice, but one of the quotes that uh, she sent to me is that she feels it's uh, extremely important to preserve our natural resources. And we do have really cool natural resources here in the Southwest Michigan area um, for future generations to enjoy as I have growing up in Michigan's great Southwest. Yes, so I went to school here at Andrews four years. I've been teaching here at Andrews for 20 something years, 25. So I have uh, experienced the great Southwest. It is beautiful. So without any further ado, let's welcome Brandy Wise Tenter to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. And uh, one of the things that the Conservation District does each year is a annual tree sale. And so how I got involved in the conservation district was I had called the office to get more information on the tree sale. My husband and I had just bought some property and we wanted to plant some pine trees. And so I got on the conservation district's um, email list and Nancy had at one time um, put a message out on the distribution list that there were openings on their board. And so 
I had called to talk to her to kind of get more information about that. So that's really how my history with the conservation district um, began. Okay. And it's nine years later and we're still going strong. So, that's all right. Uh, St. Patrick's Day. Huh? Yeah, I think Happy St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's okay. Day. I think I've been up to Nancy's office too a while ago, maybe five years or so ago. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you an um, introduction to Nancy. So Nancy grew up in Berrien County, Michigan, um, was raised on a farm where she learned to appreciate the value of growing healthy food in a sustainable manner. Uh, graduated from the University of Kentucky with a bachelor's degree in agriculture and a minor in animal science. Has been employed as the manager of the conservation district since 2008. So Nancy has a lot of experience in a lot of different areas from, you know, soil, water, reforestation, dune. Um, if Nancy can't answer it, she can find someone in the office that can. So a really good resource. Um, for everyone in our community. Um, so one of her main things in, in her current role is to interact with landowners and farmers in the community to provide them tools to assist them on, on soil, on water conservation, on best practices. And she partners with many organizations to protect and preserve those natural resources. So partnerships with our drain commission, partnerships with our parks and recreation, um, just really some of those joint partnerships that help us to get additional grants, get our name out in the community and really <laughs> build our brand as a conservation district. So what Nancy's gonna show today is just a brief history of the conservation districts and how that works in the US and then in our county. And then some current programs and services that are offered and kind of a brief synopsis of each of the main programs. Um, and some some cool photos to kind of show you a little bit about us and what we do. All right, very so. good. Thank you so much. Nancy, it's yours. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. So you could go ahead and say. <laughs> Very nice. It's good. Okay. And can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Wonderful. Well, Brandy, thank you for that introduction. Um, I think she covered everything. So I, <laughs> I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> she did a very um, good job. Yes. <laughs> she, did a, she did a great job. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I would just like to start out by saying that um, it is, um, you never know what's going to happen from day to day because we do have our pause in so many different things. And we have people from, you know, not just farmers, but um, people from all walks of life that may call us with a question or stop in with a question. Um, and you've always gotta be on your toes. You know, how can, what's the best way you can direct them and how can you help them? And if, if it's not something that, you know, the technicians here in our office um, can help them with, then we, we all will do our best to try to find a local resource um, or through our partners um, to help meet their needs. Um, <clears throat> and then I also, <clears throat> I also would like to mention um, if there's any students that are going to watch this mm -hmm. um, and have not yet chosen their um, career path to please consider natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, it is really a vast and diverse arena. Um, there's lots of different paths that one could take and, and skilled folks are needed. So um, with that being said, um, I am going to talk about the history of conservation districts. I'm going to talk briefly about the history of Berrien County Conservation District, where we're located. And then I'm going to cover some of our main programs. And I do want to say that I cannot talk about the history of conservation districts without talking 
about the history of our federal partner, the Natural Resources Conservation District. I'm sorry, um, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, it was in the beginning, it was known as the Soil Conservation Service. And then later they changed the name to Natural Resources Conservation Service, which from now on I'm going to refer to as NRCS, which is its acronym. So the conservation districts really didn't happen until the federal side of this happened. And I do have a short um, video clip that I'm gonna be showing too on that. Okay. Bear with me. So what, what is a conservation district? So we are <clears throat> specialized local units of government tasked with conservation. And we will utilize state, federal, local, and private um, resources to address conservation challenges. All of our programming is voluntary. Oh, hang on just a second, I gotta move this bar down. All of our program is voluntary. Um, we are not a regulatory agency um, and we offer programming that directly assists and improves environmental quality uh, in our local communities. So how do we do this? Uh, providing technical assistance and education to help farmers and other landowners better manage their soil health, protect water. Uh, we will help forest owners improve the health of their forests. We have programs to monitor and improve water quality, manage invasive species, and where applicable, preserve dunes. Uh, we coordinate with and provide connections, you know, like I said before, to local, state, and federal resources. So how did this all begin? Well, we got to go back in history to like the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, you see this picture on the screen of, of prairie. Um, I'm not, uh, this was a stock photo. I'm not quite sure what's planted here but um, it's reminiscent of what um, a prairie might've looked like a um, hundred years ago or longer, but there was a big push um, to move to the plain states um, to plow the grass under and grow crops. Um, wheat, for example, paid very well. And for quite a few years, um, it was profitable for those that were farming the Plain States. And I'm talking about the states pretty much from Texas north to the Dakotas and then heading over to Montana, that, that section of the country. Um, but after some time of growing the same thing, um, plowing it every year, not really doing anything to build up the soil, the soils were starting to become depleted. Um, and then in the decade of the 1930s, there was a drought. So the, there was a drought that actually lasted for 11 years. So not only were they seeing a, a decline um, you know, in soil and in their crop productivity, but the they were leaving the soil open. They weren't keeping it covered. And the winds came, there was no water from rain. And what was developed was called um, dust storms. It's often referred to as a dust bowl. Um, these storms, there's, a, there's been several names for them. One of them is Black Blizzard. Um, there is actually a movie that was made called Black Blizzard. Um, if anyone's interested, they could Google it. Um, there's really a lot of um, images um, taken during that time. So there was a gentleman uh, named Hugh Hammond Bennett, and he was a soil scientist. And Hugh Hammond Bennett predicted that if we don't start 
you know, he predicted this like back in 1905, if we don't start taking care of our soil, we're not going to, we're not going to have soil to grow crops on. And, and a lot of people didn't listen to him. So this video that I'm going to show here in a few minutes is actually a documentary about Hugh Hammond Bennett. Um, he's called the father of conservation. And I've just taken a short clip out of it to try to show the development of NRCS leading to the development of conservation districts. So around 1930, um, and you can see in this image, then um, this is an actual photo. This is what people were dealing with. Um, you can't really live in anything like that. Um, this was an image taken in Washington as these dust storms reached all across the nation. And this is an image of Hugh Hammond Bennett. And this is one of his famous quotes, take care of the land and the land will take care of you. Um, kind of jumping ahead a little bit here before we get to the video, but I wanted to give you a little background before I showed the video because it, it get, it's going to give you a little bit more context. So once um, Hugh Hammond Bennett convinced Congress to put some funding towards development of an agency to address soil conservation, then um, President Roosevelt in 1937, went to all the governors of the states and said, you know, listen, we have, we, you know, this is after the federal programs were passed. He said, we have these federal programs, but people don't want people from Washington coming and telling them how to farm or how to grow their crops. So he figured it's best if it was done at a local level. So he enacted this um, this policy where states could write up their own conservation district law, um, divide parts of the states up into districts, and then utilize the federal programs. Um, and in some cases, there were federal funding to help farmers directly. It's called cost share, and we still have it today. Um, but to utilize local people to address these problems, because um, again, talking about no one wants Washington telling you what to do, but if you talk to your neighbor, if you talk to your friend, if you talk to your cousin, and they say, listen, this, I started doing this, and this really works, and this has helped my soil, helped my farm. Um, so that's how districts were born out of this. Okay, so I am gonna go ahead and start the video and hopefully you all will be able to hear it okay. By 1929, the erosion problem was getting more attention from lawmakers. USDA was given funding for soil erosion research and Bennett was asked to lead the work. He jumped at the chance and began setting up experiment stations, soil research centers in the hardest hit areas of the country. In October of that year, the stock market crashed. The Great Depression followed. Wheat prices plummeted. Farmers in the plains plowed up even more land to try to recoup their losses. When prices dropped further, many abandoned their fields. Between 1930 and 1935, 150,000 people moved out of the Great Plains in a mass exodus. From the Dakotas to Texas, millions of acres of native grasses had been wiped out. In its place was exposed soil. And then the droughts came together with the depression. And obviously then, when the wind started blowing, it just blew that soil away from us. Huge sweeping dust storms called black blizzards became common. When President Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933, he spoke of stabilizing the economy and providing relief to those who were suffering. He implemented a series of experimental programs known collectively as the New Deal. Soil erosion was now recognized as a national epidemic. Through the New Deal, 
funding was set aside for emergency soil erosion work. In August 1933, a temporary emergency relief organization called the Soil Erosion Service was set up in the Department of Interior. Hugh Hammond Bennett was asked to lead the work. Listen to the warning of Hugh Bennett, director of United States Soil Erosion Service. We Americans have been the greatest destroyers of land, of any race or people, barbaric or civilized, unless immediate steps are taken to restore grass to millions of acres of these sun-scorched, wind-eroded lands, we shall have on our hands a new man-made Sahara, where formerly was rich grazing land. Bennett swiftly gathered his dream team, a core group of engineers, biologists, economists, soil surveyors, and technicians. He set forth how business would be conducted. They would work with nature and not against it. They would assess the needs on each piece of land and make recommendations based on what they found. There was no one-size-fits-all approach. Often, several conservation activities working together as a conservation system would be necessary. They would consider that land's place within the entire watershed. Bennett pushed his team to get out from behind the desk. They would go on the farmer's land and walk with him side by side. Together, they would decide what should be done to conserve soil and water and help ensure healthy production. Success could only be realized by combining scientific principles with practicality. It was as much of an art as it was a science. Farmers particularly liked the farm plan and the way it was made. Farmer and conservation technician walking over the farm, field by field, acre by acre, cooperatively develop the farm conservation plan, the blueprint for soil conservation action. No work was started until the farmer approved the plan. Through demonstration projects in select watersheds, Bennett showcased how conservation practices could turn a farm around. This was visible proof to other farmers that these practices worked. They would serve to help farmers take the leap to try something new. The first demonstration project was set up in 1933 near La Crosse, Wisconsin, the Coon Creek Watershed Project. And this was the place where there was a lot of erosion challenges and they put in place contour strips, terraces, grass waterways, a lot of different practices we still use today. And they were starting to see real results for landscape scale conservation. Bennett enlisted the help of young men from the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, to work on these projects. In speaking to the group, he said, we are not merely crusaders, but soldiers on the firing line of defending the vital substance of our homeland. As this work went on, the dust storms continued across the country. This period became known as the Dust Bowl. So on May 12th, 1934, everything that Bennett predicted in 1905 came true. One of the great dust storms occurred from Montana in the north to Texas in the south. Dust so thick, visibility was limited to a few feet. There was a lot of concern in the Capitol and a lot of bills were filed. And one of the bills was to establish a permanent agency called the Soil Conservation Service. There was a bit of a tussle between the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture as to where it should be. And President Roosevelt finally made the decision that it would be in the Department of Agriculture. And there was a Senate committee having a hearing, and Bennett was invited to uh, present the case. Now on that day, there was a dust storm which had come through Kansas, so they expected it in Washington. It's your arrival, I thought, might settle any senatorial misgivings. <coughs> but it didn't come as soon as he thought it was going to be, so he had to delay the whole Senate hearings. He, he'd made up things to, to delay it. Citing a lot of data, fighting for time. Some senators fell asleep, I think, but he kept on going, and finally around mid-afternoon, the storm hit D.C. And as Bennett was testifying, the room darkens. And he said, we took a little time off and went to the window and saw the dust storm. A modern miracle. One of the senators remarked, it's getting dark. Another senator ventured, maybe it's dust. I said, you're right, senator, it's another dust storm. We went back to that table, and I was feeling pretty good. The bill passed unanimously, not one dissenting vote establishing the Soil Conservation Service in 1935. The first Soil Conservation Act 
in this country or in any country. And Bennett was put in charge of. From Washington come U.S. Department of Agriculture soil experts. To prevent the spread of erosion, partially damaged land is terraced and contoured. From grasslands, sod is stripped and transplanted to barren ground. New vegetation produced by scientific strip planting gives hope to the farmers of the Dust Bowl. Bennett and SCS leaders recognized that the work needed to happen faster on the land. They needed more local voices, experts who knew the farmers and their families and the history of the soil in their backyards. Farming operations are not like a franchise where you might have one size fits all. Everyone's different. The local people know the land and the people best in their own neighborhood. So Bennett had it right by saying locally led is the way to go. They developed a blueprint for creating local organizations to help farmers and ranchers called Soil Conservation Districts. In support, President Roosevelt sent a letter to state governors urging them to implement the districts in their states. He expressed the need to take action to control erosion, warning that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. On August 4, 1937, the Brown Creek Soil Conservation District in Bennett's hometown of Anson County, North Carolina, became the first district to implement the blueprint. There are now more than 3,000 conservation districts across the U.S. Bennett said himself later on that he considered the establishment of the Soil and Water Conservation Districts one of the greatest advancements in all of agriculture because that did bring the landowner, the farmer, into the picture and really get conservation on the ground, as we like to say. The districts belong to the farmers who brought them into existence and they remain under farmer direction and I hope will continue to remain so. Okay. Um can everybody hear me now again? Yes. Okay. So that film, I took like a 10 minute chunk out of that film, but if you ever get the chance, go to YouTube and just type in Hugh Hammond Bennett. Um, the whole film is, I think like 35 minutes long, something like that. And um, it's really interesting. Talks about his beginnings and there's a little bit more on the end. Um, so I, I hope you all enjoyed watching that and, and kind of filled in some of the gaps. Um, okay, so in Michigan, our first, um, uh, the, sorry, the state of Michigan passed the Michigan Soil Conservation District Law, um, and that was began in 1937. So Michigan didn't wait very long before um, jumping on the wagon and um, agreeing with uh, what President Roosevelt said. There are currently 75 conservation districts in Michigan. Um, a few of the conservation districts cover multiple counties. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the history of Berrien County, but I did want to mention that um, through my research, I found that Ottawa County in Michigan was the first one that um, developed a board of directors and a conservation district. And the best research I could find said 1938. Mm. So our history here, um, well, first of all, we were on the shores of Lake Michigan. We're in the very Southwest corner of Michigan. Um, this is one of our beaches. And so I wanted you all to, to take note of that. So we have, you know, we have challenges um, that might be different from challenges in other counties. And um, I'm just going to say that um, because this has the word watershed in it and watershed was also mentioned in that film, 
If anybody does not know what a watershed is, a watershed is just an area of land that drains to a certain body of water. So for example, um, we have a very we are we have a very large watershed, one of them in our county, and that's the St. Joseph River watershed, which actually spans many counties. But the St. Joseph River watershed, if your your land might drain to a creek that drains to a river that drains to the St. Joe River, the St. Joe River ultimately drains to Lake Michigan. All right, so originally divided by watersheds, Berrien County was once home to two conservation districts, the St. Joseph River Conservation District, which started out uh, with five townships joining in, so does Berrien and Pipestone. And then within six years, 11 more townships were interested and they were added to the coverage area. And then in 1946, the Galeen River Soil Conservation District was formed, and that took the balance of the county's townships. And the Galeen River uh, watershed is approximately the lower third of Berrien County. Well, they went with two districts in our county for, for a long time, but as we approached 2006, um, it became apparent that having, having two different boards operate in the same county and having two different boards trying to get grants um, to do projects and having two different boards or um, utilizing uh, one manager, because um, the best I can tell that they both just used, you know, like one office uh, administrator, et cetera. Um, and then partnering with NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, remember the federal version, um, it really was not an efficient system. So they um, had a hearing, petitioned the state, um, and they were ultimately combined in 2006, um, becoming what is now the Berrien County Conservation District. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our programs and I wanna preface this by saying that all conservation districts started due to soil erosion. You know, that was the primary focus. Um, we've evolved over the years. We still address soil um, erosion or soil conservation. We talk more about soil health um, perhaps than we do about erosion. Um, there are different practices one can do to improve their soil health. Um, but that also um, conservation districts, while they have some of the same programs and they all started the same, each one is unique because depending on what part of the state or, or in other states, you know, what part of the country um, they are in, um, they have different challenges. And they will offer some different programs. Um, I will give an example. An example would be forestry. So in the northern part of Michigan, uh, conservation districts employ a forestry technician. They have um, where they can go out and meet with landowners. Um, they can set them up with, um, you know, timber companies. Um, manage the health of their forests. But here in Berrien County, we don't have we don't have a lot of forests. So we do not have a forestry technician. We can we can help people still by referring them to some federal programs. Um, but that's just one example of some of the differences. <clears throat> so our main program here is a program that is administered through the district. It is um, from a Michigan, ag, uh, from a state grant, the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. And this program is called MEEP, that's its acronym, and that is short for the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program. And that is a proactive program that helps farms of all sizes and commodities voluntarily prevent or minimize agricultural pollution risks. At its heart, 
it's trying to prevent um, environmental damage to our groundwater and our surface water, but it also addresses soil health, soil erosion, um, other land quality issues. And it's a popular program uh, in the state and Michigan is the only state that offers this. And um, we have a lot of support for that. Our next um, big program that we have, um, where our technician provides education on growing, harvesting and handling fresh fruits and vegetables to um, decrease consumer risk. So this was born out of a federal law um, started, um, I wanna say five or six years ago, perhaps, called the Food Safety Modernization Act. And um, Michigan provides, again, this is through a grant to the Department of Agriculture in Michigan, and it provides a technician uh, that works here in our office, and he, he actually covers several counties. But he will work one-on-one -on -one with growers of fresh fruits and vegetables. So Bering County is very diverse. We, we have a lot of different type of crops, a lot of different types of produce. Um, outside of California, we are probably the most diverse county. Um, if we had a warm season all year round, we could grow avocados and pineapples, but we don't. <laughs> so that was, that's what it makes California the most diverse, but we are very diverse. Um, and people do grow fresh produce, not only for farm stands, you know, roadside stands, um, but the produce may go to farmers markets, it may go to schools, it may go to your local grocery store, or it may go to a grocery store on the other side of the country. So it's really important to, um, you know, provide a template on how this produce is grown and handled to, to keep everybody safe and to prevent food recalls and things like that. Uh, Brandy mentioned our reforestation program. So we hold a tree and shrub sale every spring and the premise is to provide anyone with low cost, small seedlings to green up our world, to go plant trees, to go plant shrubs. Um, you, you can use these for huge stands to reforest an area. You can use these in your backyard. Um, farmers will buy trees to create windbreaks um, in the film that I showed you, I don't know if you remember, but um, Hugh Hammond Bennett had hired <clears throat> um, young people from the Conservation Corps, and you may have wondered what they were doing, uh, you know, like on those hillsides. They were planting um, trees, they were planting small seedlings um, because they wanted to create these vast windbreaks to help cut down on wind erosion for the soil. Um, well, this is kind of the same thing, but obviously there's many different uses um, for the trees in our county. And um, again, we sell small seedlings. It's very popular. And we're always looking for volunteers. So anybody watching this wants to come volunteer and help us get ready for this, uh, we'll welcome them. Another program that we have is stream monitoring. Um, these photos are taken um, at a local creek called Hickory Creek. And what we're doing here is uh, collecting aquatic insects. We do this twice a year in the spring and the fall. And over long term, you know, not just a couple of years, but over many years, what insects we collect or don't collect gives us a window into the health of the stream. And it's another volunteer-based program. Um, we like to have a lot of volunteers come out and, and get, their, get their feet wet, so to speak. So other programs. Um, so 
we partner with NRCS. We're housed in an NRCS office and we provide the outreach and education for the NRCS programs. And those are administered through the, through the federal farm bill program. Um, other things that we do is we, we promote native plants. Native plants have deep roots. They're good for the soil to hold it together. Those deep roots allow rain penetration or infiltration would be a better word. And they provide um, nesting and feeding habitat for pollinators. And without pollinators, you don't have crops. So uh, we really promote native plants. We do have an edu um, we do have an educational workshop every year, and then we we have a sale. Um, to the right there, you will see um, a sign from our hunting access program. Uh, the acronym for that is HAP. And that's just a partnership we have with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources uh, called the DNR. And we facilitate leases between the DNR and landowners to allow hunting on private land. Um, over to the far left, um, we will, for a fee, provide um, revegetation recommendations for people doing work in the dunes. Um, all that work is per, um, under a permit that they will get. And the permit requires, you know, like a revegetation plan. And we can provide that to try to keep our dunes stable. We are a partner in a CISMA. A CISMA is a cooperative invasive species management area. The CISMA has its own staff and they help us out by providing invasive species education and management. Um, what's pictured there, the, um, the brown stuff growing is called Phragmites. Um, Phragmites is really a problem for, it, it grows along the edges of lakes. It also will grow in ditches. Um, it, likes, it likes wet areas. Um, it's a problem for homeowners living living there because it, it does a couple things. It prevents anything else from growing there. It blocks their view of the lake. And at certain times of the year, it's actually a fire hazard because it'll burn very hot. Um, and it's um, the the material. It's it's you know it gets kind of dry and it burns easily. And the other picture is um, hemlock woolly adelgid. And that is a bug that can destroy hemlock trees, which are very important trees to the environment. So I think I covered everything on that page. We host on-farm field days. Um, during the year, we'll have workshops and presentations on different topics. It kind of changes every year what, what we offer. Um, sometimes it's by request. Uh, we'll get uh, expert speakers to come in on a particular topic. And um, this is open, you know, not only to our community, but surrounding communities as well. And just some other things that we do. Um, we do provide um, a piece of farm equipment called a no-till drill that we will rent out to landowners. And we sponsor the county plat book and I will also provide um, education on the use of rain barrels and composting and then we sell rainbow rain barrels and these tumbling composters this is our current staff um, Mike and Sherman from NRCS and Patrick, myself, Lisa, and James from the Conservation District. And everybody here is really hard workers and we do whatever we can to help you out um, you know, with, your, with your conservation needs. Okay, are there, are there any questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. That was very good. Great historical information, great information about your program. 
I have tons of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming based on the history and what you put out there that the conservation districts are all federally funded. Is there any other type of funding that sort of comes to you through the state? And Actually, I'm glad I'm glad that you asked that question. We are not federally funded. Oh, okay. we're not. No. Um, so conservation district started out being state funded in every state. Okay. I can't speak to what's happening in other states, but in the state of Michigan, um, in 2010, um, funding from Michigan went away mm. all across the state. Um, a lot of districts were really scrambling. Um, some did have to close their doors for a little bit. Wow. Um, but in the long run, it made us stronger. We, mm. it pushed us to, to seek out grants from other agencies um, you know, grants um, filtered down from the EPA um, through the Forest Service to the Michigan Department of, Re of Natural Resources, the DNR, um, local community fund grants. Um, you know, we, uh, we had to probably let some people go. Staffing was very tight. So, for example, in our office, um, up until about five years ago, we only had two staff members, myself and the MEEP technician. And between the two of us, we we did a lot of work. We, we wore a lot of hats, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so where we're at currently with funding, and, and this is going to vary throughout the state because some, some districts, I think 13, 13 out of the 75 districts, have um, millages, mm. so they have count, they have county um, millages that they'll you know anywhere from what four to I'm not exactly sure how long you can get a millage for at any one time. Um, I've heard up to eleven years, but I don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, as of fiscal year twenty two. Um, the state did authorize some funding, so we do get some funding that's administered through the Department of Agriculture in Michigan. So we do have some state funding now. Um, we have had local funding for years. Our, our local county commissioners authorize an appropriation for us. Um, our reforestation sale um, provides funding for us. Um, grants, lots of grants, um, the MEEP grant and the produce safety grant in particular provide funding for us. Um, so there's not any one pool of funding, um, but we, but as far as I know, there has never been federal funding for conservation districts. However, because we are, we are housed in an NRCS office, we do get, you know, federal benefits that way. Um, we, we get the benefit of, of being here in the same office, you know, lights, water, electricity, <laughs> things okay. like that. Okay. Okay. So I have other questions, but I'll open it up. Um, first, Br Brandy, do you have comments, questions? Well, I think a really good point that Nancy had made earlier on in the session was if you are going into a career, if you're getting your education and, and you are set on a set career path, um, sometimes it's really beneficial to kind of go outside the box a little bit to get some more experience, mm -hmm. um, some field experience, interactions with the different collaborative partners we talked okay. about. And so I think it's a really good, um, you know, Nancy is a good resource to talk to, to reach out to, but I mean, also to see what other programs are available. So, um, throughout the state, like, like Nancy had said, each conservation district has different funds coming in, but there are 
education um, roles. There are, you know, roles where you're out in the field doing different things, interacting with different um, partners in, in agriculture in some capacity. Um, you know, there's there's just a, a lot of different things. So I would say don't focus in on that one set path, but kind of think about the different experiences that uh, you might like to have to really grow your career in, in that field. So um, it is a great opportunity, a lot of different um, roles, experiences, uh, and, and great people to partner with. Okay. So to follow up on that for a bit, number one, um, do you have, do you or any of the conservation districts have summer work opportunities or internships or what have you for young people who are out of school, students who are out of school during the summertime? Um, right now at the Berrien Conservation District, we don't, but the conservation district just north of us, uh -huh. um, they are looking for summer work um, on invasive species. Um, okay. and, and again, that's part of our partnership in that CISMA, that invasive species management area. Okay. And, and then um, anyone can inquire with um, our NRCS manager here to see if there's an internship opportunity with NRCS. And then that way, that would kind of be a blended internship with the conservation district and NRCS if, if they here were here. And that would be, in, that would involve, um, you know, some field work. But you are always open for volunteer experiences. We're always open for volunteers. Okay. We, uh, like right now coming up this spring, um, I need to schedule volunteers for a reforestation sale. Um, I could use a few for our native plant sale. I need volunteers for our stream monitoring day um, that, that'll be coming up on May 7th. Um, and then <clears throat> we're going to be doing a stream cleanup. Um, just it's a trash pickup and I need volunteers for that. And that's going to be on Earth Day, April 22nd. So anybody who's interested, you know, just call us. If you if you miss the opportunities this year, trust me, every year we need volunteers. <laughs> And no Dr. experience Murray? needed. Like, okay. Yeah. Dr. Murray? Yes. I am so glad I'm on this one. <laughs> I will become a volunteer. This is Prince Ala Tobias. And I would love for our Benton Harbor Team Solutions to get other people that listen to us on the radio or in the newspaper to join me because what I just heard is something I've had questions about. And I love they have this um session about education, how they can educate us about so much that's going on in our community with soil and other things. So I will number one, become a volunteer. Thank you for this opportunity at Environmental Fridays. But I did have some questions too, which I'm sure offline, I would like to talk to you about um, your soil testing, um, your native tree growing, and some of the other things that you offer. And especially when it came to education, I would like to include that in the Benton Spirit newspaper so more people can be educated and can actually be part of what you're doing because it, because it is so, so important. You know, we are dealing with soil testing now in our community because of the water and lead in Benton Harbor. And that's how Benton Harbor Team Solutions came about. But more and more people are now very eager to know more. You know, what does that lead to? And farming, you talked about farming. Um, do you test soil for farmers at this point? Uh, we don't do it for them. So um, under the MEEP program, the Michigan Agriculture and Environmental Assurance Program, um, soil, soil testing um, is offered. Um, we do cover that for them because there's a cost. And our, our local um, extension office used to um, send the test to Michigan State University. However, they're no longer doing that. So we use another source. It's called Great Lakes um, Laboratories, I believe is the name. Yeah. So we, we send it off um, for, for those that are not um, under the MEEP program. Um, 
unfortunately will guide them and, and help them with the um, feedback that they get after their soil test as far as what, you know, what does the analysis mean? And we could provide recommendations for them, um, but they would have to pay for that. So at least we know there are options because I know Michigan State Extension at one point, and so I'm glad you mentioned it because that is a void that we have right now. Absolutely. For potential farmers, um, we have a community farm um, right here in the Ooh. Benton Harbor area. And so I know there are many farms going up, many gardens going up. Um, there's just such a need for it right now from a nutritional standpoint, as well as to a high cost of what things are costing us. And so it is critical that we tap in. So you talk about people that will be part of your, you said meat program. How can we yes. become part of that? If you um, want to contact my meat tech or contact me and I can set it up either okay. way. And, and she will come out and meet with you and go over what you're doing and uh, explain everything to you. It's a very in-depth program, so um, I can't, you know, provide a ton of details right, right now, but, um, you know, definitely we'll set you up with a technician. There's no charge, absolutely no charge. Um, she can come out and see your student farm, walk it with you. Um, spend as much time as you need. And, it, and again, there's no charge for her services. Wonderful. Because we were actually going as African-Americans, we were going to the Black Farmers Association. Someone had told us to go that route, but let it be that route or someone here locally that can assist us in trying to educate more people to become farmers, or should I say, have their own garden. And that's really what we're looking at outside of our community guard garden, helping people to become better farmers and how we can actually grow that. So we know we have the Michigan State Extension Program, which is really down the street from us. But um, we're trying to get more involved with them, or should I say, hoping they will get more involved with us. Um, but sure. we're now that we know that we have this avenue through you, it would be very helpful. But you talked also about your educational programs that you have. So like every component, every program had an educational component to it. How do you have a list of what's forthcoming here 2023 as far as your classes and educating people that we can actually um, help you get the word out? Well, we just had um, our new plant presentation that was um, last week. Um, the next thing that we'll be having will be an on-farm field day that'll be in the summer, and that's that's open to the public. You don't have to be a you know a farmer to come to it or anything like that. Um, we kind of um, schedule some things as they come up. Um, I I did want to mention because they're um, so I you said you're from Benton Harbor. And I briefly mentioned that we're going to be doing a stream cleanup on um, Earth Day, April 22nd. But what I left out was we're also going to be doing, I'm on a committee that's going to be doing an Earth Day celebration um, near where we're doing the stream cleanup. And that's at Hall Park in Benton Harbor. And not only will we be there and providing some you know, educational materials, but there's going to be other organizations that are going to be setting up that day. Um, uh, Sarah Nature Center, uh, Love Creek Nature Center. Um, uh, we're still, actually, we're still working on a list. The um, sustain, um, Southern Michigan Sustainability. Um, so that would be a really good day to where you can talk to folks from other agencies too that that might be of an interest to you and it's right there locally in your community so yeah, i know I, I do know about it so oh okay yeah Wonderful. i do know about it so thank you for reminding me because when you start talking about earth day i kept saying there's something else going on <laughs> exactly and then you said ox creek i'm like oh yes that's it so and i think what i love about this too dr murray is that you give environmental fridays an opportunity to also um, for us to tune in on YouTube if we miss this um, season, this um, session of Environmental Fridays, that we can hear this again and help promote what they're doing. 
because I think this is so important what they're doing and it's something that's been actually a little excluded from our community to know more about, to be educated about and to be to participate in some of the activities that's going on. And that's what we're trying to do is to get our community more active. Um, I'm originally from Buchanan, so I heard some of the places that you mentioned that I know about from Buchanan, but as we now start being more prepared and more actually vigilant about the environment, what you're doing plays such an important role. And I'm hoping to educate more people to be part of what you're doing. So I'm not gonna take up too much more time because there may be other people who wanna chime, chime in, but I am glad that you're on this show and I'm glad that I tuned in and I'm going to share it once he has the other, have when it's audio, when it's recorded and edited and send out to people so they can know more about what you're doing and help you like I will be volunteering to help you. And I'm glad you're on the show. And thank you, Dr. Murray and Environmental Fridays for this. Okay, so a couple of follow-ups. Number one, I think, um, Princella, that um, you could, and I'll get to Pat, I see Pat's hand. Um, I think you, guys should talk about at least a one month um an occurring recurring sorry recurring one month page in the benton spirit from Berrien county conservation district and you know related related agencies i think that would be a good idea also i know you have a program a radio show every tuesday i think that would be another opportunity for Nancy and for Brandy to come on and, and talk about some of the things that are upcoming in our district. So those are two specific opportunities in us trying to communicate um, on a regular basis. Um, environmental oh, what's, the, what's the name of that radio show? It's uh, called Princess? Wake Up, Wake Up Benton Harbor. It's so we also have a, a a team called Benton Harbor Team Solutions. So every Tuesday is called Wake Up Benton Harbor on WVBH 105.3 FM in Benton Harbor. And we're looking to reach out to, to another radio station that would host it as well as our own online radio station. But currently for a year and a half, we've been on 105.3 FM. WVBH. Okay, thank you. You're so welcome. So you guys um, could connect up offline. Um, I'll give you... Um, each other's email and stuff like that. Uh, Pat, you had a- uh, Yes, um, I kind of hesitated because there's a lot of background noise on. We have a con we have a competition to do just now. My husband's on another um, video conference. But what I wanted to say was, this is fascinating. We don't have quite the same problem, but what we do have is, um, the necessity for soil conservation in watershed areas, which are hillside areas, which are becoming the natural targets for developers. And they do not understand that if you clear land, you clear forest off a hillside, then the soil erosion is um, significant. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. That, But last question, well, one question I would like to ask, are there areas in the US where they still experience dust bowls or have they managed to solve the problem mainly throughout the US? There, there are, they're not necessarily called dust bowls, but there are areas um, that still under high winds will get um, silt thrown up in the air. Um, we stress what's called cover crops Cover crops, um, it can be many different species, but always keeping the land covered really minimizes erosion from both runoff from heavy rains and blow off from um, the wind. So areas that may experience hot, dry summers or falls or even winters, and, and there's not a cover crop on there, um, a, a, it's a grass type crop or it can be other, you know, other things other than grasses that's in between your growing season. So for example, um, when, you're, when your soybeans are done, um, you should try for, for uh, in the fall and then you can get rid of it in the spring, but you wanna plant some kind of cover crop 
So the ground's not bare. So, so it's not no longer called a dust bowl because they're, they're no longer, you know, spread across the whole United States, like back in the thirties, but yeah, there are pockets where you're still going to have wind storms that pick up a lot of soil. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> are you good, Pat? Yes, uh, no, that was, I understand the importance of keeping soil covered and I see it on a daily basis. How does one get I'm through? Afraid of it because of where I suppose we're it requires political energy. will. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about no-till farming, right? Because isn't is first of all, is that something I'm assuming the conservation district, not only yours but others, would promote and encourage? Farming. Oh, absolutely. And what's the status of that practice in Berrien County? Um, No-till is actually becoming more popular. Um, it's, it's not for every type of soil, um, but for the majority of soils that, and you want to grow your crop, um, no-till farming is very effective. Um, um, just a, a very simplified example would be um, you're using a planter that drills or pokes a hole in the soil and drops the seed mm -hmm. um, versus tilling the soil up and then using a conventional planter to drop the seed. And then there's, um, there's wheels and stuff on the back of the planter that, you know, packs the soil around the seed. So no-till will, in the long run, it actually saves the farmer money okay. because you're not first tilling it and then coming back again with your tractor pulling a cedar. Um, but it does have its challenges. So for example, if your previous crop was soybeans, no-till is pretty easy. You don't, have, you don't have a lot of residue on the field um, whereas corn, if, uh, if you, you know, tried to be conscious about it and over the winter, you have left your, your broken corn stalks after your harvest on the field as a cover. Um, and that's called trash, but it's a good kind of trash. <laughs> um, and then in the spring, you go to use a no-till, um, it's called a no-till drill. That's the piece of equipment. Um, you do run into challenges because sometimes that bogs the drill down having that. Um, mm -hmm. If you have planted a cover crop, um, you do need to destroy that cover crop in the spring, um, generally, depending on what type of cover crop you've used, um, to use your no-till drill. And that's often destroyed with an herbicide. Okay. So so nothing's ever real simple. You know, there's there's... There's always, you know, complications. There's always challenges you have to work around. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, no-till no is um, highly recommended as a conservation method, uh, you know, for saving the soil, saving time, saving uh, diesel fuel, you know, et cetera. So I want to kind of switch to um, what we talked about earlier because I'm thinking about our potential audience, high school students, college students. Um, you had your degree in agriculture, I believe, and you're working in natural resources, environmental sustainability, lots of interlapping areas. Um, so it seems to me like in terms of career advice, students could get involved with mostly any of the biological sciences, agriculture. Um, there is, of course, environmental science. Do you have anything to say about that as well? Because you can come to natural resources from multiple areas, right? Right. No, I think you just said it best. Absolutely. Um, any, really anything in the sciences, um, even, you know, animal science. Um, mm -hmm. If you're, if you're going to, you um, you know, like major in biology or something like that, you know, I would recommend also taking some courses in forestry, taking some soil courses. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you have, you know, if you have that availability, have that option. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a more selfish question. Do, because I work here at Andrews, I'm wondering if you guys interact with us at Andrews, our biology department, um, uh, let's see, agriculture, um, do you do guest lectures and all that? Um, any sort of, or is this an area that you want to develop some more? I would love to develop it some more. Um, we okay. do know your farm manager very well. Okay. Um, your farm manager has worked um, with this office. He has worked both with NRCS and he's also um, worked with our SISMA partners, the, the invasive species. Um, and then we have had people from this office be guest lecturers. Um, mm -hmm. I can't recall specifically when or the topic, but we, mm -hmm. we have guest lectured at Andrews. Uh, but yeah, we definitely would like to develop that more, you know, in the future. Yeah, because we are walking distance from you guys. That's right. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, any other questions, comments? I learned a lot. I would like to say it's lovely to talk to the, I mean, you're, with, you're talking to me, by the way, I live in Trinidad and Tobago, yes. and the clearing of the hillsides <laughs> is what causes enormous flooding and chaos um, in, the, in the flat areas below. So I think um, it is so good to see that something actually succeeded. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you from Trinidad. I know we have at least two or three persons on from Trinidad. Pat Manny uh, is an environmental science biology teacher, so she could probably talk about some of this in her class as well. All right, so if no other questions, comments, this has been a very uh, information-rich, inspiring um you know, presentation and dialogue. And we hope it doesn't stay here. Princella and Nancy, you guys need to get together <laughs> and um, we can try to get information out to our youth, to our students, to our general community in the Bering County area. Thank you, yes. everyone. Thank you so much for having us. It takes a village. That's true. That is so true. All right. Have a wonderful and, day. Have a great weekend. Nancy, you wanted to say something? Um, I just wanted to say that I I guess I failed to include a slide that had my contact, uh, but I can be reached by email nancy.carpenter at macd.org. Okay. And I'll send it out that your information um, to, you know, Princella and to others that are interested. The, this video will be on YouTube. So people will get that information there as well. Thank you so very much. You guys did us proud here in Berrien County. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Have you. a great weekend. Thank you too. Okay. Bye-bye.